A household name as a football star and then as a murder suspect. O.J. Simpson leaves behind a complicated legacy. Team coverage tonight on The Rundown. A look back at the trial of the century with those who covered it extensively and firsthand accounts from the infamous Bronco chase. Then a family tragedy. Two boys hospitalized after a house fire in Northern Virginia. Their father tells News 4 how his boys are doing and what the community is doing to help. Plus, I'm Adam Tuss at the Wilson Building where DDOT's new director faced a tough line of questioning on everything from the circulator to bike lanes. Coming up next, I'll tell you about some projects that were thought to be happening are no longer on the table. You're watching the News 4 Rundown. Hello there and thanks for joining us for the News 4 Rundown, our newscast streaming for you. I'm Leon Harris and we begin with the big story of the day, the death of O.J. Simpson. One of the most popular and then polarizing celebrities this country has ever seen. His family made the announcement on O.J.'s Twitter account saying that he had died of cancer. America fell in love with O.J. for his football prowess. He was widely regarded as one of the greatest running backs of all time. But the perception of him as a sports star, actor, and broadcaster changed a decade and a half after his football career ended. Simpson arrested and charged for the murders of his former wife and her friend in 1994. The charges sparked a trial that was watched in millions of homes across the country and around the globe. NBC's Jay Gray starts off our team coverage with a look back at Simpson's unmatched career and the courtroom chaos that overshadowed it. A Heisman Trophy winner and NFL Hall of Fame running back, O.J. Simpson, will be remembered most for something he could never run from. Born Orenthal James Simpson in 1947, he was raised by a single mom on the rough side of San Francisco. His way out? Football. A college star at USC, he was drafted by the Buffalo Bills, where he had a record-setting NFL career, including a league MVP. He retired as one of the best to ever play the game. And for O.J., the spotlight never dimmed. Nobody does it better than Transitioning into a successful career in TV and movies. That's great. He was inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 1985, the same year he married his second wife, Nicole Brown. The couple had two children, but apparently a rocky marriage that included allegations of domestic abuse. Nicole Brown Simpson filed for divorce in February of 1992, and just over two years later, she and a friend, Ron Goldman, were found murdered in her Brentwood home. Suspect may be driving a white or light colored Ford Bronco. Five days after the deadly attack driven by a former teammate, Simpson led officers on a low speed chase across Los Angeles, threatening to take his own life before eventually surrendering to police. He was charged with murder. The court proceedings dubbed the trial of the century. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit lasted nine months every minute. We, the jury, in the involved in title action, find the defendant, or Orenthal James Simpson, not guilty of a... On live TV. Justice was not served. Searching for that justice, the Goldman family won a civil suit. Simpson ordered to pay more than $33 million. He returned to court multiple times over the next several years for traffic violations, even pirating cable TV. But it was a Las Vegas robbery in 2008, Simpson saying he was taking back stolen personal property that ultimately sent him to prison. Count one, conspiracy to commit a crime. Guilty. Count Sentenced two. to 33 years, he served just over nine. Thank you. Thank you. Before being paroled in 2017. Jay Gray, NBC News. I'm joined now by Chris Gordon, a familiar face to many of you, I'm hoping and I'm sure. Uh, he's a former Court TV reporter and a former colleague of ours here at NBC4. He covered both the O.J. murder and the civil trial extensively. Both of those were moments where everyone can say, I knew where I was when. Well, I was on the set doing, uh, anchoring the 5 o'clock news when all of a sudden we saw these helicopter shots out of L.A. on the freeway and we were told, uh, O.J. is inside that Bronco with a gun being driven by a friend mm -hmm. that he is either, we didn't know, grieving or fleeing. And then all of a sudden there were people on the overpasses shouting for him. He arrived home and he was put in handcuffs. And we knew right then this is an amazing story. He, of course, went to trial downtown L.A. Uh, he had the dream team of defense lawyers, uh, Johnny Cochran and 
and uh, Alan Dershowitz and F. Lee Bailey and so many of them. Mm -hmm. uh, prosecution side, Marsha Clark and Chris Darden, an amazing case. And then there were the elements of evidence, DNA, bloody gloves. One found at the crime scene, one found at O.J. Simpson's residence. What mm -hmm. was that about? A bloody footprint, uh, uh, the print of a shoe uh, at the crime scene with a victim's blood in it and a knife which the prosecution was unable to tie to, to um, O.J. Simpson. And the defense uh, attacked the DNA, attacked the, uh, the gloves, and uh, ended up with a not guilty verdict. But they also attacked the L.A. Police Department. Absolutely. And what they did was they exposed something that a lot of the black people in Los Angeles had been complaining about for years, about the way that they said they were being treated by the LAPD, and what they thought was the obvious racism that was, through, that was rife throughout the entire department. When the not guilty verdict came in, outside the courthouse, there was uh, uh, cheering and a celebration going on because there was a, a very large and strong contingent in favor of O.J. Mm -hmm. All of the Dream Teamers w went on to become famous in their own right. Um, what did you make of that? Well, first of all, they were all good lawyers, including on the, uh, on the prosecution side. Mm -hmm. um, I was told a story by Johnny Cochran. He told me that um, at one point, uh, Marsha Clark, as people who watched the trial would have seen, would always come over and, and visit with him, be friendly with the Dream Team, uh -huh. with the defense, with the people representing Simpson. And I believe Chris Darden got upset, and he was angry. And he one day confronted Johnny Co Cochran. This story comes from Johnny. And he said, you know, I just may have Simpson try on those, those bloody gloves, one of which was found in the murder scene, one of which was found at O.J. Simpson. I may just have your client try on those gloves in front of the jury. Right. And Johnny Cochran, without missing a beat, said, go ahead. You don't have blah, blah, blah to do that. No kidding. And so he baited him. Well, that was the, really a, a, a master stroke by Johnny Carson. It was the because, pivotal moment of the trial. Because, as we all know, O.J. Simpson tried on the, the gloves. Wet gloves, wet by, with blood, could shrink. He was wearing latex gloves. He was an actor. And he struggled to put them on. And that led to the most famous line of all, if they don't fit, you must, you must acquit. acquit. Let me ask you this, because you, were, you had the eyes of a reporter and of a lawyer as you were watching this. When you see that, the way the verdict came in, as quickly as it did, after the fact that they had been, that jury had been sequestered for months, mm -hmm. what did you think at the time? Well, I, I thought that they uh, simply believed that uh, O.J. Simpson was not proven to be guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was plenty of evidence, but not guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Looking back at it nearly 30 years later, how do you think that verdict has aged? Well, uh, I think it, it allows people to have their own view. I think anybody over dinner, if you're asked, would have a view of his guilt or innocence. And they'd be right, because if you said he's not guilty, well, that was the, the verdict, when all the evidence was seen and heard and analyzed and cross-examined. At the same time, if you feel he did it, you have the civil verdict that says he was responsible for those murders. This story, this event, this trial had everything. Fame, fortune, you had celebrities, you had um, a courtroom mystery, you had violence, and you had race. That combination of factors just made this such a unique moment in history. Do you think you really realized how big that was at the time? You did, because as you say, right from the start, from that Bronco chase, from the arrest, people had opinions. It was the lead story every night here in Washington, Virginia, Maryland. That's the importance of the trout here in this area. All right, Chris, I, I could talk about this all day with you. Thank you so much for coming in and sharing your insights. Thank you for having me. Now, as we just mentioned, it's almost impossible to think about O.J. Simpson without remembering the deaths of his ex-wife, Nicole Brown Simpson, and her friend, Ron Goldman. Their deaths were at the center of the wild Bronco chase, an eventual trial that captivated the entire country in the mid-90s. An NBC LA reporter recounts where he was during that chase on the road in front of Simpson. Mr. Simpson is not appearing. Mr. Simpson is a fugitive of justice right now. Then I went on the radio, and I remember somebody on the assignment desk said, 
Yes, Conan, what is it? We're busy. And I said to them, well, listen, I'm in front of O.J. Simpson right now, and we're taking pictures out the rear view mirror, but if you want to, we'll just pull to the side uh, if you're too busy. This is our status. We are in front of O.J.'s vehicle. We've been trying to shoot it through the rear view mirror. Under the vehicular code today, what I did would have been illegal. Imagine, cars have pulled to the side of the road on the freeway. The vehicle behind me is trailed by a dozen police units, lights and sirens, code three. It's almost like a motorcade. It was being broadcast, television, radio, and all of a sudden it took on this life, the likes of which you'll never see again and never saw it before. Followed by, again, a dozen uh, black and white uh, lights and sirens. He was waving frantically with his left arm as he was driving. It was as if he was showing uh, the, the officers where he was intended on going. If you didn't know this case was special, before this pursuit, you did after it. You realized that this is a case like none other. You can watch the full segment on the O.J. Simpson Freeway Pursuit on NBCLosAngeles.com. It's part of NBC LA's original series, I Was There When. Look for O.J. Simpson Chase at the top of the page there. We are bringing you complete coverage here following O.J. Simpson's death. You can find local reaction and more key moments from the trial of the century on our website, NBCWashington.com. Just search O.J. Simpson. All right, time now for four things to know tonight. The U.S. Attorney for the District of Columbia indicted a man for the murder of a visiting teacher on the campus of Catholic University. 22-year-old Jaime Macedo is facing first-degree murder and attempted armed robbery charges. Macedo was accused of shooting Maxwell Emerson after following him from the Brookland Metro Station last July. Macedo is set to be arraigned on Friday. Police are searching for the suspect who allegedly attempted to abduct a 10-year-old girl in Gaithersburg. Detectives released this new sketch of the man that they're searching for. The attempted abduction happened March 10th along Lost Knife Road. Police say the girl was sitting outside of an apartment when the suspect grabbed her arm and then told her to come with him. The victim believes that the man ran away when he saw police cars in the neighborhood. If you recognize the possible suspect in this sketch, call Montgomery County Police ASAP. Two and a half weeks after the collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore, Maryland Governor Wes Moore is launching a new resource. Today, he announced the Francis Scott Key Bridge Response website that will serve as a hub for Marylanders in search of federal, state, and local resources. It will also include information on relief programs for workers impacted and businesses as well. The interpreter for L.A. Dodgers star Shohei Otani is now facing federal bank fraud charges. That announced today could carry up to 30 years in prison. 39-year-old Ipe Mizuhara is accused of transferring more than $16 million out of Otani's bank account without his knowledge. Mizuhara has acted as Otani's interpreter and manager since Otani began playing in the U.S. back in 2018. Shock and fear for families in Northeast D.C. tonight after a mass shooting that killed a man and injured five others, including two kids. The gunfire erupted last night on 21st Street in the Carver-Langston neighborhood. The two boys who were shot are just 9 and 12 years old. They did both survive. Today, the search continues for the two shooters. 29-year-old Aubrey McLeod was the man who died. He leaves behind three kids, the youngest just two years old. News 4's Amy Cho spoke with the mother of one of the other victims, that 12-year-old boy, and his mother says that he tried to run home for help and was then hit by a car. He's definitely in a lot of pain. Um, he has a lot of burns across his body from when he was hit by the car. If you saw these children outside, why even go follow through with what you obviously had planned? Like, it, it's, it doesn't make sense. Like, our kids are safe because you guys are acting crazy. The mother says that her son was released from the hospital this morning. 
Two former Warren County Sheriff's deputies are facing new indictments in connection with a traffic stop that severely injured a man struggling with dementia. A Warren County grand jury brought felony homicide charges against 31-year-old Zachary Fadley and 27-year-old Tyler Poe. Back in April of 2022, the pair pulled over 77-year-old Ralph Ennis for speeding near Front Royal. Investigators say that during that traffic stop, Fadley and Poe assaulted Ennis. And has suffered a severe head injury and died two weeks later. Both Fadley and Poe were arraigned on Monday and then released on bond. Developing tonight, two young boys are in critical condition after a house fire in Clifton, Virginia. Three-year-old Zachariah and six-year-old William were pulled out of a burning home yesterday afternoon. Their father, James Bryce, was at work when he got a terrifying call. The boy's grandparents and eight-year-old brother, Logan, made it out of the home okay. Firefighters rescued Zachariah and William and then immediately started CPR on them. They were unresponsive for about 45 minutes after the fire, but they did survive, and they're now incub intubated rather, in the ICU at Children's National Hospital. One of the doctors have told me you've got strong kids, and I was like, I hope so. Thank you so much. You know, it's what we're praying for. It's what we're living for. The fire marshal is still investigating the cause of that fire. Tonight, the church that the family attends in Gainesville is hosting a prayer service, and they are accepting donations for the Bryce family. Coming up on the News 4 Rundown, transportation projects scrapped. D.C.'s big budget cuts impacting some vital services. Our Adam Tuss is following what this could mean for your commute. Plus, a warning to stay diligent when you're swiping out there. The possible credit card skimmer that one local shopper found at self-checkout. And the best ways for you to protect your personal information when you're out doing your grocery shopping. Pointed questions today for the head of the District Department of Transportation. D.C. is facing a big budget gap and is making some tough decisions about cutting things like bus service and road projects. News 4 Transportation reporter Adam Tuss has been following it all from the Wilson Building. Yeah, a marathon session of questioning here for DDOT's new director at the Wilson Building. Everything from the circulator bus going away to some bike lanes going away. That came up and there were some heated moments. Talking about the circulator bus coming to the end of the line after almost 20 years, it's clear there are frustrations. I'm being asked, this council's being asked, to cut more than $100 million and eliminate the circulator with absolutely no promise of what's going to actually happen. Ward 6 Council Member Charles Allen. But once I vote on this, over $100 million is removed. We can't go back. DDOT Chief Sharon Kirschbaum says the circulator hasn't recovered ridership since the pandemic. The buses are getting old and it would be very expensive to purchase new ones. At this point in time, we would need to buy a new fleet, um, which is a significant investment. For now, it's expected the program will end around this time next year and Metro buses will then assume some of the circulator routes. And for the first time, DDOT revealed that a controversial bike lane project along busy Connecticut Avenue in northwest D.C. will not go forward. Even though a bike lane had been recommended for nearly three miles between the Maryland line and Woodley Park, and there was years of study, a road redesign with safety in mind will start without a bike lane. We will share our new plans uh, with the public and engage with them on the safety project on Connecticut Avenue. Um, but the decision right now is to do the safety project without a bike lane. It's expected that pedestrian improvements and more parking will be included in the safety redesign of Connecticut Avenue. At the Wilson Building, Adam Tuss, News 4. You may want to take an extra careful look the next time that you check out at your local supermarket. A customer at a Georgetown Safeway was doing just that when he noticed what looked like a credit card skimmer. John Perry Miller says it all started last night at self-checkout inside the store on Wisconsin Avenue. He noticed that the keypad was sparkling clean and he had a feeling something was up. So I yanked on it and it was loose. And so I called over the attendant and um, he and he uh, was like, no, it's not a skimmer. And I said, it's a skimmer. And so we yanked it off together all the way. And he was like, oh, my God. And I said, see, you know, it's a skimmer. We asked Safeway if they can confirm that this was a credit card skimming device. The retailer said, quote, 
Safeway takes these issues seriously and is investigating this matter in coordination with law enforcement to ensure appropriate action has been taken, end quote. Uh, if you don't like paying with cash and you want to protect your information, experts say that you should look for anything loose, broken, or crooked before you swipe your card. And they say for the highest level of safety, you should use Apple or Google Pay. In the months since two children were hit and killed while they were using a crosswalk in Prince George's County, there's been a push to keep crosswalks safer for our kids. Prince George's police have stepped in as crossing guards near schools. News Force Juliana Valencia has more from near Riverdale Elementary School. You know, I can't even imagine it, it, the unthinkable what happened uh, in that November. Nothing will, will bring those babies back, but it will bring them a, a sense that we care and we and the police department cares. It's been almost five months since five year old Sky Sosa and 10 year old Shalom Emba were killed at this crosswalk outside Riverdale Elementary School. This morning, Prince George's County Police Chief Malik Aziz helped their school mates get across safely. These are all our children and we are accountable and responsible to all of them. And we want to get out here and do our part and play our role in making sure people are safe. There was no crossing guard at the time of the crash, but the chief has said that was unlikely to have made a difference. Since that awful day in November, the chief says 500 people have applied to be crossing guards. 80 are currently in background checks. And while they get permanent crossing guards in place, the chief says their commanders and even staff from the fire department have come out to help since. Parent Estela Reyes says she's seen the increased presence. There is more security. I feel safer now because sometimes I have to wait for my little girl here, and now there's always someone that helps her cross. Other parents wish crossing guards could be there all the time to keep people from speeding. They're always in a hurry to get to work. That's the problem. They don't make the stop. As for this morning, before leaving, the chief checked in, asking students to remind others to cross safely. So you gonna help me with that? Yeah. In Prince George's County. Me with that, you're better than me. I'm just Juliana Valencia, News Four. That's good to see. Our little ones deserve to be safe. Still to come on the rundown just ahead: scholarship surprise. How college just got slightly more affordable for some local students. Every dollar counts when it comes to paying for college, and today that financial burden got a little bit easier for 40 local students. News Force Dominique Moody was there when Amazon unveiled a STEM scholarship surprise. 40 DMV students from 36 schools have no idea what they're in for. Many believe they're here for a computer science and engineering conference. Getting the email about the conference, I was like, uh, what's going on? The email had said what we were going to do, so toward the building and then talk to um, an Amazon leader. Their intuition was right on the money, leading to this joyous moment. <laughs> Tech giant Amazon announcing these bright students were receiving scholarships worth up to $40,000, money to help with college and their dreams of graduating with a computer science or engineering degree. Continuing my education. I know for sure that I want to do computer science. I enjoy programming. I've already had a little bit of experience with that. This money is going to help me so much to like actually pay for college. Montgomery County senior Kemzi Umaku says he's grateful. The Nigeria native says this is one step closer to his ultimate goal. Provide help to my community in Nigeria because I was originally born from Nigeria, so maybe starting like, I think maybe like in the future, I do want to start a charity. The scholarships are the tip of the iceberg. There's also a paid Amazon internship waiting for them after their first year of college. I was really excited. I didn't expect it at all, so I was surprised. And um, it opens up a lot of doors for me. We know that the power of networks is critical uh, in, in work, and so to have that community start to build, that network start to build right after college uh, will deepen their sense of confidence and their own potential. You can consider this a win for parents too. Those like Rodney Gaylor, who says he's proud of his daughter's journey. It's amazing. Uh, I remember walking up and down the hill to take her to school, you know, quiz her and all on the timetables. To see the work pay off, it's, it's, it's a good feeling. In Virginia, 
Dominique Moody, News 4. Oh, they're off to a great start. Hey, we're just over 100 days away from the Paris 2024 Olympics right here on NBC4, by the way. Tonight, we're getting a closer look at what the athletes are going to be wearing for the big games. Nike unveiled their Olympic kits today. Uh, these are the uniforms for track and field, basketball, soccer, and breaking. The new breakdancing event at the game. A big focus this year is going to be on the shoes. This Olympic Alpha Fly 3 is going to hit the market this summer. So you'll get a chance to dress like your favorite athletes. If you can afford it, that'll do it for the News 4 Rundown. Thanks for joining us, everybody. I'm Leon Harris. Sure hope to see you back here tomorrow. Stay safe until then.